Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland. So uh, this is a video about the decline of Wasp America. And one of my loving fans asked me to do this. So first of all, what is a wasp? Well, traditionally it stood for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, but some people say really the, the W should be for wealthy, not white, because if you're Anglo-Saxon, then yes, of course you're white. Well, what's an Anglo-Saxon then? Well, the Angles came from um, what's now Northern Germany in the uh, uh, 5th century AD to England. And the Saxons likewise, because in Saxony, the various, sorry, in Germany, the various states, Lower Saxony, Saxony and Saxony, Anhalt, where Saxons lived. And indeed, the original England is actually a peninsula in Germany. And then there's the England that we know. So, but Anglo-Saxon doesn't just refer to the English or the Germans. It's the North West Europeans more generally, people from Scotland or Wales, arguably Ireland, certain people in Ireland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. I'm just trying to think where else. Uh, Belgium is more arguable, France, and not really, Switzerland, kind of. So, um, you know, ethnic and geographical boundaries are, are blurred. Um, anyway, uh, but some people say, well, Wasp, we're really only talking about the affluent ones, because uh, there's the white working class, which is many people in the United States, not all of whom are, are Anglo-Saxon, and um, some of those would be of um, English, Scots, German descent, and so on, and some of them are looked down on by rich whites, called white trash, or disparages rednecks, although I understand that term has undergone a glorious reclamation since uh, um, Jeff Foxworthy in the early 90s. I remember 1607, the first permanent uh, European settlement in what is now the United States, Jamestown, Virginia. There had been an earlier one called Roanoke or something like that, but the people had disappeared and nobody knows quite what happened to them. There's some theory they were all abducted by Native Americans. So it's only a little bit later, 1619, 400 years ago, the first African people were um, abducted by um, uh, whites and brought to um, America. So African Americans started then. So, um, you know, wasps were never the only people in what became the United States, even on the East Coast. There were obviously Native Americans whom they d dealt with in different ways. Sometimes they got along just fine, and they traded, and they purchased land. Remember, the population density was very, very low. Sometimes they intermarried, sometimes they were hostile, they fought each other. And like then obviously there were African Americans from almost the very beginning. So um, Anglo-Saxon is often uh, used as being coterminous with English. Now it's the, the Welsh and Scots are very similar in Ireland. Well, it's highly complicated because we had loads of English uh, immigrants into Ireland and lots of Irish people have gone to England and people have gone back and forth and back and forth. And it's very difficult to, to separate who's who. But uh, many people in, in Ireland say, well, not English, we're not Anglo-Saxon at all. And indeed, in, in Irish, um, we call English, England Sassana, as in um, Saxony. And the English are Sassanoch, as in Saxons, um, and, and all the rest of it. Also, with the Welsh saying, ooh, they're not Anglo-Saxons either. The Welsh language calling England Hlogan, as in lost land, because Wales used to be bigger. But anyway... It, the term is used loosely for people of Northwest European ancestry. So the other people who settled on in the, what was then the 13 colonies were not just from the British Isles, but there were obviously the, the Dutch people in uh, New Amsterdam. That's why there was, the, you know, there's Stoy Savant High School because one of the Dutch governors. Remember, it's only about, oh, I can't remember, 1670, that the uh, Dutch ceded it to the um, English. And there were Swedes who settled there and, and Germans even from the very early days. Of course, Germany wasn't, united back then. So who was German was a very loose concept. Um, we talk about the Scotch-Irish. Right, oh, my goodness, this gets complicated. So in the 17th century, lots of uh, Scots people moved to the northern part of Ireland, that province called Ulster. And in the 1550s, there'd been the Reformation in Scotland, as in Protestantism had come in. So almost everybody in Scotland was a Protestant, whereas in Ireland, most of us had remained Catholics. But um, Scots Protestants and English Protestants and Welsh Protestants moved in, settled particularly in the north and in Dublin. Um, and so the Scotch-Irish are meant to be people who come from Northern Ireland and are of fairly recent Scottish ancestry and are Protestant. I think without exception, you're going to call them Scotch-Irish. So um, that's that. Remember like George Washington in um, one of his uh, um, speeches said, oh, I'll take a stand with my Scotch-Irish of Virginia. They were his steadfast supporters. 
and to people being called hillbillies. I think it's because some of those Scotch Irish people, they look back to King Billy, that's William the Third, um, who'd who they'd been on his side in 1690 at the Battle of the Boyne, things like that. Um, so the founding fathers were wasps without exception, so far as I know. Um, anyway, uh, that's that. Then we get on to other people who are coming in significant numbers. So you could go back to 1776. People who were in what's now the United States would have been 80% wasp, I suppose. Not all, not, not all wealthy, but wasp in the earlier meaning of wasp. So some African Americans, some Native Americans, and some people of mixed blood. Um, and then after that, after independence, significant numbers of uh, German people started to arrive. A few Irish Catholics started to arrive. There are a few Irish Catholics in, in the United States even before that. If you go back to the Boston Massacre, it's, it's, it's raised in the defense. I, was, I think it was John Adams who actually um, courageously defended the British soldiers accused of killing civilians. And he said there were tags around, which is an appropriate term for an Irish Catholic. And almost as though this was an excuse, this made it acceptable for the soldiers to open fire. Um, and John Adams didn't get these guys acquitted, but he got them the mildest possible punishment being branded in the thumb. Um, anyway, so the Know Nothings came along around the 1840s. Remember in Ireland, from 1846 on, we're, we're, we're afflicted by a famine. And um, ooh, something like 800,000 of us perished in that famine. And perhaps double that number emigrated over the next few decades. The emigration wasn't solely because of the famine. There was emigration happening in any, any way, but it just accelerated. Anyway, so the, the Know Nothings came along, which was a nativist society, which is WASP saying, ooh, we mustn't allow anybody who's not WASP. Now, there was no law against people coming from whatever part of the world at that time. And I'd have to remind these people that uh, the um, uh, Declaration of Independence saying that um, there should be no discrimination on the grounds of race, creed, or color, which was, of course, staggeringly ironic, considering many of the founding fathers held people in servitude, and servitude was only for black people. Whites could never be, could never be um, enslaved. Yes, I know there were indentured servants, which was not, not the same thing, it was for a limited period of years, and was not, it was not heritable, that status. So the know-nothings would have their question by the authorities, what are you doing in trying to terrorize these immigrants? They'd say, I know nothing. That's how they got their name. So um, it's a distasteful xenophobic strand in American life, which still hasn't died away. And you, you find that sort of attitude in, in many countries all around the world. Um, and the sort of people who would have been mistreated by the know-nothings, those of Irish Catholic stock or Germans, particularly German Catholics, um, obviously they're completely integrated into American society now, and unfortunately a few of their descendants would be doing uh, this sort of same sort of thing that their ancestors had suffered from, which is saying that um, immigrants are dirt, particularly if they're of disfavoured ethnic or religious groups. So we skip over the Civil War, and um, then came the Ku Klux Klan, an exclusively WASP organisation who abominated anybody who wasn't WASP. So please don't get the impression I'm saying that WASPs are bad. There are many marvellous WASPs and who've done splendid things, but um, I'm just looking at some of the exclusively WASP organisations. Um, and uh, the, the WASP majority declined. It was not quite so high as it had been before. So the Ku Klux Klan was a terrorist organisation founded by Nathan Bedford Forrest, formerly a Confederate cavalry commander. Look at his, look at his surname, Bedford Forrest. Well, Bedford's a town in England, Forrest is clearly an English surname. Um, and he, anyone who was of Eastern European stock, he hated um, Latinos and so on. He loathed them. Uh, African Americans, they were not to have equality at all. Any white who was sympathetic to the plight of African Americans must also be terrorized. And they were, they were the KKK tended to be anti-alcohol against shops opening on Sundays. They were enforcing Sabbatarianism. Uh, they were very puritanical. They thought divorce was an abomination. Um, uh, so, uh, and they, did, they hated Jewish people as well. And then, um, so Italian people have been arriving in the United States in tiny numbers in the early 19th century, as had Polish people. There were Poles who fought in the American Revolution, on the revolutionary side. But in the late 19th century, uh, people from um, Italy, uh, Poland, from other Eastern European countries, started to arrive in significant numbers. There was considerable anti-Catholicism in the United States at that time. And uh, Catholics weren't discriminated against by law but there was some popular prejudice. It depends where you were. So talk about the Boston Brahmins, the upper class Bostonians were um, of wasp descent and are distinctly cool about um, uh, Catholics rising in society. Um, and um, the Orange Order existed in the United States back then. And so that's a, 
an exclusively Protestant organization to exalt the memory of William III, that's William of Orange, fought the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, as they felt had saved liberty for uh, Great Britain and therefore later on for America. The, but the Orange Order hardly exists in the United States today. And there were Orange riots, um, Catholics and Orangemen fighting against each other. Fortunately, that doesn't happen in the United States anymore. Um, so Roosevelt in the 1930s allegedly said, um, this is a Protestant country, the Catholics and Jews are here on sufferance. As in, we're doing them a favour by allowing them to be here. They don't actually have a right to be here. Um, so uh, right at the end of the 19th century, Jewish immigration increased sharply. Jewish people coming from the Russian Empire. Remember, there's a pale of settlement. Jewish people generally were only permitted to settle in the very western zones of the Russian Empire. That's to say Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and half of what's now Poland. Um, now, unfortunately, that then was to put them in the path of the Wehrmacht, when the Wehrmacht invaded in 1941. So they were severely discriminated against in the Russian Empire and often uh, slaughtered in huge numbers. That's where the word pogrom comes from. So they emigrated to the United States. Not that many indigenous Russians came, or some Latvian, Lithuanians, not huge numbers. Norwegians and so on, not many people particularly converted, uh, objected to them. And the Norwegian Americans and so on tended to settle the very northern states along the Canadian frontier. Portuguese people were coming in significant numbers, and then Mexican people were coming in serious numbers. So it was the poorest border that the United States had with Mexico. Of course, people could come up all the way through Latin America. People then tended not to move that much in those days. You could, uh, train is a faster way to get around. Not many people had horses. And remember that um, those southwestern states had been part of Mexico until 1848. California, New Mexico, uh, Utah, Nevada, um, and uh, am I missing one out? Arizona, and of course Texas had until 1836. So there were some Hispanic people there anyway, and that's why the toponyms are usually Hispanophone, like Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Diego, Santa Barbara, and so forth, or Nevada, meaning snowy, uh, and on and on, or at various places in Texas like San Antonio. Corpus Christi, okay, that's Latin, body of Christ, but it relates to Catholicism. Santa Fe, El Paso, Anyway, um, so uh, there was not that much Hispanic immigration. There were some Hispanic Americans there already, but some people didn't accept them already and say that so-and-so is a Mex, contemptuously. And then there was Chinese Im um, uh, immigration in the, in the late 19th century, often as um, navvies are building the railroad. I would say railway, but they're almost exclusively men. Um, and so they tended to die out, just so there weren't women for them to have children with, and they very seldom married um, white Americans or African Americans. Um, and there was a Chinese Exclusion Act, and some viciously racist things were said against them. Right up to the 1940s, Chinese people weren't officially permitted to immigrate. And a very few Indians came in the very first year of the 20th century. And there was a Ghadar organization, which is an Indian revolutionary organization uh, devoted to overthrowing the British Raj in India. Um, so very few Japanese Americans arrived, and Korean Americans remember Korea had been annexed by the Japanese in 1910. So these Koreans were sometimes recorded as being Japanese, although many of them would take the most strenuous possible objection to being denominated Japanese. Um, so um, in more recent times, like since the Second World War, things have changed. Previously, legislation said you, we allow people in in proportion to the number of their nationality already in the, already in the country. <laughs> it gets quite complicated. I can't remember what the ratio was. Supposing there are a million Irish Americans will allow in 10,000 Irish Americans each year, something like that. Supposing there are 2 million German Americans, will allow 20,000 Germans in each year, something like that. So um, if you came from a country which sent almost nobody to the United States, let's say Bulgaria, then very, very few would be, al would be allowed in, all right? Um, but uh, John F. Kennedy ended that. No more national or racial preferences. Equality, there's also the green card lottery, just... Um, putting your application in, and just by chance you might be picked out. There are other visas, Einstein visas, as they're colloquially known, for those who are exceptionally talented or highly qualified, got a PhD in whatever. Allegedly, um, Melania, Melania Trump came in that way as a model. I don't know if she's got a degree in anything. Um, but so, so people have come from all over the world, the United States. There are Egyptian Americans, Nigerian Americans, Iranian Americans. And there's this noticeable difference between African Americans whose ancestors came uh, when they were held in thraldom from the 17th century onwards, to those um, who have come voluntarily in the 20th century. Obviously, people coming from some of the Caribbean countries, like Jamaica and uh, the Bahamas, 
uh, Canadians coming to live in the United States, particularly French Canadians in um, the very uh, northeast of the country. Um, so, as I say, you go back to a time when um, the U.S. was uh, over 85 percent um, uh, white, almost all WASP, maybe 80 percent WASP, but that's declined and declined, partly because WASPs tend not to have a high, higher fertility rate. African Americans, as a proportion of the population, are roughly stable. Asian Americans um, kind of growing. They tend to be a younger community, even they tend not to have a huge number of children and more of them are moving in. Very, very few Europeans want to move to the United States. As Al Gore said in the 90s, when's the last time you met a Swedish immigrant? Well, people from Scandinavia just don't move to the United States anymore because things are so splendid in Scandinavia. Why would they? You know, with among the highest life expectancy in the world, a very clean environment, a very low crime rate, and uh, you can um, go to uh, university without paying a penny except through taxation, have superb public health care, all funded through taxation, things like that. It's just a splendid quality of life, paid maternity leave, quite a lot of time off, paid reasonable working hours, and on and on and on, and very few social problems. So um, it's people from uh, the uh, less prosperous parts of the world wouldn't be inclined to move to the United States. So whites are about 65% of the American population. They're falling as a proportion. And I wonder whether Trump was um, the white supremacist's last stand or the white nationalist's last stand. Not everybody who voted for him is white, and not all, all the whites who voted for him are white nationalists, but quite a few are. There's no question about that. He was enthusiastically endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan, and he didn't repudiate them. And then, and then he equivocated about the Charlottesville protests. Should the, should the statue of General Lee stay up? I don't have a strong feeling about it. I actually am mind, slightly minded to say yes. But uh, the people who are zealously in favour of it tended to be racists. So you shouldn't say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're all on a, on a par morally, those the anti-Nazis and the Nazis there. Um, but I, I have to uh, underscore the fact that um, not all whites are wasps. So wasps are probably under 50 percent, depending how strictly you define it. Because um, what if your ancestry is English and Slovak? So Slovaks are not wasps. Would that person be a wasp or not? How about Meghan Markle? She's a wasp on her father's side, not on her um, mother's side. So is she a wasp? You see, it's debatable. Often people say there was this one drop theory. If someone had any African ancestry, that person was black. Now, obviously, these people can become so pale because their African stock is so diluted by intermarriage with whites or other races that they're not identifiably African, not by phenotype. So they just blend into the white community or Hispanic community and so on. Um, so yeah, wasps are under 50% of the population are falling and they're concentrated in certain areas of the country, particularly um, the northern states, uh, to some extent New England, the southern states quite a lot, but then there's a large African-American uh, minority there. And the states along the Mexican border, the Hispanic community is growing rapidly. Another thing I should point out is the Hispanic uh, community has got a higher fertility rate than any other ethnic group. So Hispanics are about 20% of the population and they're growing rapidly. Now, People who live in the United States, 320 million, not all of whom are American citizens. There are some people who are there on green cards, some people are permanent residents or a pathway to citizenship, so becoming citizens, and of course there are Americans who live abroad. But so I'm talking about people who live in the United States, not necessarily United States uh, citizens. So I think WASPs are not a very united group. They're such a huge group, so diffuse. Um, and as I said, it's um, a very uh, vexed question, who, who is a WASP and who's not? What if you've got mixed stock? Now, I'm Irish, I was brought up as a Catholic, so I'm not a wasp. Then again, I might have some Welsh, Scots, or English ancestry, so that would make me a tiny bit of a wasp. But so far as I know, looking at the surnames of my family, I'm about three quarters native Irish, but some of that was like, but then beyond that, there's a bit of Norman, Anglo-Norman or Cambro-Norman. Um, so uh, I think wasps are often not terribly conscious of being wasps. It might be colour matters to them, especially if they're white nationalists, or faith matters to them, Christianity. There does there seems to be very little aggro between Protestants and Catholics in the United States now, fascinatingly. As recently as John F. Kennedy, that was an issue for him. There's a bit of a stumbling block. Should he get the Democratic nomination? Ooh, well, um, the, uh, the people are trying to dictate to him. The papacy would say he has to do this and that, and he had to tackle the issue head on. Speaking to a conference of Protestant pastors, shouldn't we go for Hubert Humphrey, who is a rival, who was a Protestant? Well, actually, Kennedy did get the nomination. And I really think anti-Catholicism disappeared back then. Now, I know there's some ultra-Catholics who think that any criticism of the Catholic Church is, is, um, is, is anti-Catholic, which is nonsense. 
if you're treating Catholics as a quasi-ethnic group and uh, coming up with slurs against us or something like that, that would be anti-Catholicism. But a reasoned critique, including a robust one of the Catholic Church, of its uh, doctrines and practices, that's not anti-Catholicism. So um, I think uh, Protestants don't tend to care about being Protestants as such in the United States very much. Um, they care about being Christian evangelicals. They can make common cause with Catholics on things like, let's say, abortion or being against pornography or, or not wanting same-sex marriage or wanting school prayer, things of that nature. So Christian fundamentalists of all stripes, they unite. So, um, yeah, the United States is becoming um, less religious than it was. Um, and I suppose the, the very liberal people, who are often the secular people, tend to have fewer children. So that's perhaps one of the reasons it's, the United States is bifurcating between secularists and religious people. Uh, but the secularists, although more people are moving secular, secular people tend to have fewer children. Um, and um, Christian fundamentalists care to tend, tend to care about God, guns and gays. Was a God some sort of governmental policy? It's a private matter and tend to still believe in the war on drugs and things like that. Militarism, not so much into loving your enemy. So, uh, yeah, WASP America is declining and things will change. And the, um, the Republican Party relied fairly heavily on the vote of WASPs. Now, not all WASPs voted for them. Some of them uh, vote, vote for the Democrats, of course. Um, but as um, WASPs decline, then uh, the Republican Party is in trouble. And that's why the demographics made it seem like Hillary's going to win. She obviously won 2% of the vote, by 2% of the vote, but obviously lost in the, in the Electoral College. The, the Republican Party is in trouble in the long term unless they can reach out to significant numbers of other ethnic and religious groups. They had some success with Hispanics uh, in the last few years, not so much under Trump. 8% of African Americans voted for Trump, which is astonishingly which is better than under George um, W. Bush. Um, I'm just trying to think what else. Asian Americans are not moving over to him um, very much and he's not doing terribly well amongst um, the uh, young. Um, so um, now notably Catholics used to vote quite for the Democrats quite heavily, less so as they're more secure in their position, more prosperous and, and so on. I think Catholics do vote for the Democrats in a, as a majority but not, not by a huge majority as, as they used to. So that's that. Um, I don't like or dislike the decline of the proportion of wasps. The only thing is it might lead to the Republicans um, uh, winning less frequently, but um, it's really the Republican Party's policies I'm against, not anyone being WASP.